okay so now let us uh, get into the actual process of protein synthesis you know just like uh, transcription in translation also the key event in protein synthesis is where to start the process okay now in transcription there is no hard and fast rule that transcription can only start from a certain nucleotide or certain sets of nucleotide there it is within 25 to 30 nucleotides of the promoter sequence okay. but unlike that in translation protein synthesis almost always must start with an aug codon okay now uh, there are obvious issues that why should it start only with aug codon there are aug codons in the middle as well you know like methionine aug codes for methionine there is only one codon for methionine by the way it is only aug right so there are augs in the mid middle as well uh, as well how will it know that it has to start from here and not from some other aug there are lots of such issues right so we will uh, dive straight into it so let us uh, put it up front that uh, the ribosome is recruited to the rna if it is eukaryotes the ribosome will be recruited at the cap site if it is prokaryote then the ribosome will be recruited in the shine delgado sequence okay now after the ribosome is recruited to the mrna the first aug that it hits will be where translation will start there is no built in smartness in the ribosome okay it will keep on scanning crawling along the mrna is the first aug and it will start translation okay so now uh, you know the as i told you that there are uh, there is only one codon for uh, uh, methionine aug now you can imagine that the trna that will bring methionine for polymerization whether it is the first methionine or an methionine in between it can only recognize aug so now the question is should there be one aug or sorry should there be one trna or two different trnas okay now in bacteria the first first of all like the answer is that there are two different trnas one that serves the purpose for initiation and one that serves the purpose of elongation in bacteria the trna that is uh, uh, used for initiation is called is uh, post translationally mo transcriptionally modified with formyl methionine so it is called fmet uh, the trna um, but uh, like uh, with the formyl group so it is called fmet trna but that is not there in eukaryotes but irrespective in eukaryotes also you have two different trnas now why is it necessary there are two different issues that we need to understand first of all as i alluded to in the last lecture that unlike any other charged trna charged trna meaning trna that is bound to you know, an amino acid unlike any other charged trna the initiator methionyl trna must enter the ribosome not in the p site uh, a site but in the p site albeit it is happening in the on the small subunit so the a site p site etc is not yet defined but it is recruited in that place where the p site will form while the methionine that will be brought by the trna or the trna that will bring the methionine for 
any internal amino acid during the elongation phase, that tRNA will enter the A site. So that is a fundamental difference. Second is that, as you will see in next few slides, the tRNA does not come to the mRNA on its own. The charged tRNA does not come to the mRNA on its own. There is a protein that is important for incorporating the charged tRNA for the purpose of protein synthesis. And that protein in prokaryotes is called IF2. In eukaryotes is called EIF2. Initiation factor 2 or eukaryotic initiation factor 2. That is the protein that binds to the initiator tRNA. While the elongated tRNA, because it is now no longer the initiation part, the elongation part, a completely different set of proteins acts there. There it is elongation factor 1 alpha in eukaryotes, EF1 alpha, or EFTU in prokaryotes. Therefore, the tRNA, <coughs> the methionyl tRNA, whether it will be the initiated tRNA or the elongated tRNA, they have two distinct properties. One is where in ribosome it gets in and which protein brings it to the ribosome. But both the tRNAs are charged by the same uh, uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase, met uh, methionyl amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Okay. Um, so uh, that's how the tRNA is charged. So here, you know, like uh, it is uh, just an artist's rendition to show you that uh, the initiator methionyl tRNA uh, comes where will be the P site. Okay. But here the P site is not defined. P site gets defined only when the large ribosomal subunit binds to it, but you know, the relative location. Now, how does initiation happen? So for protein synthesis to initiate, you need the ribosome and you need the tRNA that is charged with methionine. Okay. Now this tRNA cannot come and bind to the ribosome on its own. So this tRNA needs, uh, you know, IF2 which needs to be bound to GPP. So a tRNA met IF2 GTP ternary complex, because there are three components, a ternary complex must be formed away from the ribosome. Now, the, in bacteria, the 30th ribosome is already uh, bound to uh, you know, the uh, IF1 and IF3. IF3 has a very special role. I'll come to it a little later. IF1 acts as a uh, protein that stimulates the GTP hydrolysis activity of IF2. Okay. Now, uh, like, sorry, <coughs> IF2 mediated uh, binding of f tRNA to the uh, 30s uh, ribosome. Okay. Now, this is how the initiation, the 30th initiation complex is formed, which lands on the Schindel-Garner sequence and then starts to crawl till it reaches the AUG. Okay? We stop here and we now look at what happens in eukaryotes. Um, sorry, uh, so, so sorry, let me complete this. So there, the once it is at the AUG, then the GTP that was bound to the EIF2 gets hydrolyzed, and that GTP hydrolysis is necessary for all these factors to be kicked out. Okay, and uh, then only 50s ribosome can bind to it, form the 70s initiation complex. Now the P site is formed, you can see it here. Now the next amino acid will come in. In fact, 
if you use a GTP analog, okay, which is which looks like GTP, but it cannot be hydrolyzed, then you will get everything up to here. Okay, you will uh, get everything up to here, but the GTP will not hydro hydrolyze and you will not get the 70s label. So therefore the GTP hydrolysis is a must. Now, you will see this regulation in translation multiple times. Therefore, it is appropriate that I tell you a little bit about uh, GTP hydrolysis by these kind of proteins. Okay. So, GTP needs to be hydrolyzed, right? What is hydrolyzing the GTP? Is it the ribosome? If you just keep GTP and the ribosome, will there be hydrolysis? The answer is no. Is it IF2? Most of the cases, the GTP binding protein will have an intrinsic GTPase activity. But that is so low that it cannot hydrolyze GTP. Because you know, that is the one that carries it to the ribosome. So ribosome uh, does not have it. IF2 does not have it. Then what has the GTPS activity? In that context, it is important to introduce you to a term called GTP uh, gap, GTPS activating protein. I am not talking about prokaryotes because I am not absolutely certain whether it is true for prokaryotes, but certainly true for eukaryotes is that the protein that binds to GTP albeit is the GTPase, but it has a very low intrinsic rate of GTP hydrolysis. It requires another protein called GTPase activating protein, which increases the intrinsic rate of hydrolysis of uh, GTP by the GTPase. The reason it is important to mention here is that the GTP that is bound to IF2 will not be hydrolyzed even here. Imagine the 30th ribosome being here. Okay, so it can have its uh, tRNA, it can have its, uh, you know, IF2, uh, GTP, and uh, IF1, and all those things. Okay. Uh, tRNA, it can have all of this, but GTP will not be hydrolyzed. It is in the, it is crawling on the mRNA. Okay, even then GTP will not be hydrolyzed. GTP hydrolysis will happen only when it comes to the start codon and the tRNA forms a, uh, you know, uh, 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 base pairing with the uh, uh, codon, the anticodon of the tRNA. Uh, base pairs with the codon. Therefore, in this context, again, I am not certain whether it is true for prokaryotes, but certainly true for eukaryotes. So in the context of translation initiation, and you will see later translation elongation, <clears throat> the GTPS activity is, the gap activity is actually a collection of things. In eukaryotes, there is, you will see that there is a dedicated protein, which is a gap. But even then, you will need the this base pairing. So tRNA bound to the anticodon, uh, the, 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 the initiated tRNA bound to the start codon, while in the context of ribosome and other initiation factors, provides that extra stimulus for the GTP to be hydrolyzed. And this is how the stringency of initiation of translation at the UG is met. Okay, so, and once the GTP is hydrolyzed, you can clearly imagine there will be a large, you know, uh, structural change and, uh, you know, like uh, IF2 uh, and IF1 all will be ejected. Very interestingly, the the okay, so I'll come to it later. <clears throat> okay, so now what happens in uh, eukaryotes? In eukaryotes, 
it is obviously a whole lot more complex. First, let us look at the mRNA. How is the mRNA? You see, there is a poly A tail, and there are this EIA4 group of proteins that bind to the cap. Okay. And because of their interaction, it is kind of like a circular structure. Okay. In the meantime, uh, separately, the ternary complex is formed, methanyl tRNA, uh, GTP, uh, and uh, like EIF2 bound GTP, they form a ternary complex. This ternary complex interacts with the ribosome, the 40th, the smaller subunit of the ribosome, which already has bound EIF1, EIF3, EIF1A, several factors. Okay. And then what is formed is a 43S pre-initiation complex. The ribosome is 40S, but because all these proteins are bound to it, so it gets a little heavier, so it's called the 43S initiation complex. That is recruited to the uh, uh, cap structure. And then it starts to scan, and wherever it, uh, it hits the AUG, it will start translation initiation. Now, it is important that I explain it to you another time, that in eukaryotes, from the cap, wherever it will see the first AUG, translation will start, start there, and wherever it will see the stop codon, it will stop there. So therefore, even if you have another AUG in here, there is, and you know, another whole reading frame in here, so this is the stop codon, absolutely no possibility of this frame to be synthesized again, okay? Because the ribosomes fall off at the stop codon, okay? the large and small ribosomes of means fall off. But in eukaryotes, because of this uh, Schein-Dalgarno sequence, wherever you have a Schein-Dalgarno sequence, the AUG right after that will be the start codon. Therefore, translation can happen simultaneously at multiple locations. So therefore, this um, operon and polycystonic RNA is a possibility in prokaryotes, but not in eukaryotes, simply because its mode of initiation of protein synthesis is completely different than that of the uh, prokaryotes. And, uh, you know, for biotechnological purposes, sometimes we need to make two proteins from the same construct. And I will tell you that how we tackle it uh, using the uh, good understanding of molecular biology and application of that in biotechnology, okay? But you understood that why polycystonic RNA is possible in bacteria and not in eukaryotes, right? That is because of the fundamental difference in how the ribosome is recruited to the mRNA. Anyway, so once it is recruited, it goes to the start codon and then all these factors come off. Now in Eukaryotes, unlike in the prokaryotes, there is one factor called EIF5, which is the actual gap, okay? <clears throat> EIF2 is the GTP binding protein. It's a three subunit protein. It's a GTP binding protein and it is the GTPs, but it has very low intrinsic GTPs activity and it binds in the ternary complex, binds to the ribosome in the presence of all other factors. Even then, ribosome is not hydrolyzed. Only when it uh, reaches the start codon and the IF5 is also there, then only the IF2 bound GTP will be hydrolyzed and all those factors will come off. Okay, and once those factors come off, then uh, the large ribosomal subunit will come, join, and the A site, P site, etc. will be defined. The next ribosome, next tRNA will come and bind to the A site, and uh, translation will happen. Okay. Now, therefore, in bacteria, you need binding with IFT for the initiator methanol tRNA to be brought to the ribosome. In eukaryotes, you need EIF2, eukaryotic initiation factor 2, to bind to the initiated uh, tRNA, 
to bring it to the ribosome in the to be part of the ternary complex, right? Now, upon viral infection, amino acid starvation, etc., certain conditions where the EIF2 alpha subunit of EIF2, EIF2 is a three subunit protein, right? Uh, protein complex. So the alpha subunit of EIF2, if it is uh, phosphorylated, then it can no longer uh, be part of the ternary, its ability to get into the ternary complex is reduced and therefore the rate of translation initiation goes down, okay? So this is a very easy mode of regulating translation by simply phosphorylating EIF2 in the alpha subunit and then uh, you know, that EIF2 is no longer effective for ternary complex formation and uh, photosynthesis rate goes down. Now, in eukaryotes, uh, as I said, that this 43S pre-initiation complex is recruited to the cap structure, and for that, you need a whole lot of proteins that are bound to the cap structure. These are called the IF4 group of factors, the IF4A, the IF4E, the IF4F, and the IF4G, okay? So the interaction between uh, the 40 years pre initiation complex and the cap bound the IF4 group of factors is responsible for recruitment of the 40 years, uh, 53 years pre initiation complex to the uh, ribosome. Okay, and it is the same IF4 group of factors that also interacts uh, with the uh, interact with the poly A binding protein, and you get this uh, non covalently circularized mRNA for translation to initiate and. Uh, then, uh, you know, like uh, uh, by aligning the sequence around the first AUG, Marilyn Kozak uh, discovered that there is some degree of sequence conservation. He, she was influenced by the concept of promoter or Scheindel Gano sequence, that do you see something like that? But in eukaryotes, you don't really have anything like that. The only thing that seems to be important is to have an A at minus C position before the AUG, okay? But otherwise, uh, like uh, you recruit the 43S pre initiation complex to the cap, it will keep on crawling till it hits the first AUG and it will form, okay? Now, uh, you know, like uh, after all the factors are ejected, then uh, 60S will bound, bind to it and you will form the 80S initiation complex to which at the P side, the next DNA will come and bind and photosynthesis will happen. Now, I told you that the recruitment of the 40S initiation complex is dependent on its interaction with the EIF4 group of proteins, right? So if EIF4 group of proteins are some, for some reason not able to recruit the 43S initiation complex, then Gap dependent translation cannot happen. Okay. Now, there are many viruses, including the cold virus, that will uh, you know, uh, dephosphorylate uh, EIF4E. When it uh, dephosphorylates EIF4E, it is no longer effective in recruiting the 43S pre initiation complex to the mRNA. Okay. Then the question will come. And how come the virus makes its own protein? Because we all know that after infection, virus uh, makes the host cell as a factory for producing its own proteins, right? Very interestingly, the viral, the, the, synthesis, the translation of viral uh, message, messengers require all the factors that are required for the host cell translation as well, other than EIF4 yeah, group of factors. Virus does not need it. What they have is their messenger RNAs will have a sequence called IRES, internal ribosome entry site. It is not clear how uh, 43S pre initiation complex is recruited to internal ribosome entry site, but it does get recruited. And then it is pretty much like you know, if you just think of IRES as Shine Dalgono sequence for a minute you immediately get uh, that how translation initiation happens there. The only difference is the Scheindel-Gano sequence is, I think, 10 nucleotide long, 
while IRDS sequence is some 1.6 kilo bases long. Now, and it is still not clear exactly how IRDS helps in internal uh, initiation of photosynthesis. But it has significant biological significance that only phosphorylated EIF40 can efficiently uh, interact with the cap structure. Dephosphorylated EIF40 cannot. Okay. So many of the viruses that depend on internal ribosomal entry site dependent protein synthesis for its uh, survival and propagation, those viruses also have an enzyme to dephosphorylate AIF40 so that the endogenous translation is stopped and only viral translation happens happily. Okay. So, uh, you know, like uh, then the question comes up that how does elongation happen? Same thing that the elongation factor EF1 alpha will form a ternary complex in, uh, in the presence of the tRNA, the next, the, the tRNA that is carrying the amino acid for elongation and GTP. This ternary complex is uh, recruited to the, the ATS initiation complex and uh, the EF1 alpha is placed in the A site, and then amino acid polymerization happens and it moves. So, you know, like uh, you should think about it uh, like this that the first uh, amino, like uh, the, the uh, tRNA bound by polypeptide, like this, these amino acids are already polymerized, is at the P site. Then a new tRNA comes along with its own amino acid and binds to the A site. And then the covalent linkage between these two happens. And this whole tRNA, this whole tRNA will attack this. And if there was a way to number this tRNA, then what you will have is uh, number two will have all the, the entire length of the polymer. And simultaneously, there will be a movement. The ribosome will slide along the mRNA by exactly three bases or one codon. So then it will come there, and then uh, it is number two, it is number three, and then eventually number two is ejected out, and number three right now is uh, proudly displaying the entire polypeptide on it. But soon that will also be ejected when the next uh, uh, you know amino acid bounty and it comes in. So um, you know. Um, So amino acid uh, like uh, peptide synthesis is always in the five prime to uh, three prime direction. It is the large RNA in the large ribosomal subunit that itself has the peptidyl transferase activity. And upon peptidyl transferase reaction, that is uh, polymerization of one more uh, amino acid to the existing polypeptide, then the, by uh, with the help of this translation initiation factor, EF2 GTP, EF2 GTP bound EF2, there will be a translocation and the mRNA will, uh, you know, like the, 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 uh, the whole system will move by three codons to accept the next uh, tRNA at the A site. Okay. So, you know, this is how it happens. I think you want know it. I will not waste time there. So, yeah. Termination of translation. Okay. That is very interesting. Termination of translation, you, as you know, there are three codons UGA, UA, and UAG. There is no tRNA corresponding to the stop codon, right? But what is there is a set of factors, release factor one and release factor uh, two, uh, or release factor three. RF1 looks like, you know, like a tRNA, okay? So it will come and bind to the, uh, to the stop codon, okay? So you see, RF1 almost looks like a tRNA to which RF3 GTP is bound. And then this protein will simply offer a water molecule here and will hydrolyze the ester bond. 
and it will fall off and the ribosomes will quickly be recycled to the cap structure and the whole story continues over again. So as I said, that GTP hydrolysis plays a major, major role. Uh, EIF2, IF2, EF1 alpha, EF2U, these are all GTP binding proteins. They have intrinsic GTP as activity. It is through regulation of that, you get uh, the precision of uh, uh, initiation of protein synthesis. The other thing that I wanted to tell you at that time, but I did not, that there is this uh, factor, EIF2, or whatever GTP is you call, they bind to GDP much more strongly than GDP. So during the process of initiation or elongation of protein synthesis, the GDP is hydrolyzed to GDP. So now you may worry that now you have a EIF2 GDP dead end complex. How will I utilize that protein again to make the next round of translation? And that is typically done by another factor, which is called a GF, GTP, GDP exchange factor, okay, or GEF. This GEF will uh, uh, catalyze the exchange on the EIF2 surface between GDP and GDP. So that's how GDP is reformed, and then uh, you know it, it does another round of translation. The other thing that I forgot to tell you that in, in prokaryotes there is a specific transcription factor called the IF3, which, if bound to the small ribosomal subunit, will not allow the large ribosomal subunit to bind to it. Therefore, this is called a dissociation factor or anti association factor. If the two subunits are dissociated, it will not allow them to come back together and associate with each other. So therefore, it is called an anti-association factor. In eukaryotes, however, quite interestingly, no anti-association factor has ever been uh, demonstrated. And the other thing that I was trying to tell you is that uh, scientists have seen it earlier and now they have seen it again that multiple different ribosomes crawl on the, foreign, uh, on the mRNA simultaneously, uh, having already made proteins of certain lengths. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so that's what it is. So, so this is you know, the uh, force field, uh, atomic force uh, microscopy to show you how they form in a complex, how is the ternary complex recruited, how is the secondary recruited and all those things. Uh, so you please, uh, you know, like uh, study on your own. If you have any question, you ask me, you let me know. I will try my best to answer that. But uh, I'll tell you that uh, in eukaryotes, no anti-association factor is known and scientists did not know that. So they spent a lot of time discover, trying to discover the anti-association factor for eukaryotes. Okay. So... I will ask you during discussion, what kind of an experiment would you do to find any protein that can possibly be an anti-association factor in eukaryotes, okay? Thank you very much. Sure. And have a very happy Diwali. <laughs>